So I want to just uh, take a chance to welcome everyone um, from across Canada, it seems. So if you haven't yet, have a look at the chat because you'll be impressed, I think, by uh, the representation we have on the call tonight from uh, different locations. Um, so I'm super happy to get us started and I, and I won't take up any more time. I'll pull lunch right in so that we can get to Dr. Kirchhoff's presentation um, as soon as possible. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Antonella. Scali, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Psoriasis Network. And before I give you a little bit of background about our organization, I just want to go through some housekeeping so we can make sure that everybody's on the same page with um, some of our uh, tech stuff here. So I mentioned already in the chat, to listen in French, please select the interpretation button that should be at the bottom of your screen to toggle to French. And you can come back and forth to English. We have live interpretation tonight um, by our colleague Ciro. Um, and it, there's some instructions um, in French for, for people who prefer to read the instructions. It's up there on the slide. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, the webinar is being recorded in English and French, and like I mentioned, will be posted for viewing shortly, so within about a week or so, um, on cpn-rcp.com. And we will also send it out to uh, send out the recordings to all of the registrants for tonight. Um, so you'll have that um, if you have to miss some um, parts. This isn't a long webinar, but it's packed full of information. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to it. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that we are all, uh, or all the participants are in listen only mode for the duration of the, se uh, of the session. So if you have questions, um, as you've done already with the locations, please just pop them into the chat box and, uh, and we'll hopefully get to as many as we can, um, at the end of Dr. Kirchhoff's presentation. Um, just want to mention again some strict uh, housekeeping that with all of as with all of our webinars and resources, the information in this presentation is general information only. So any specific or personal questions that you might have, including you know questions about vaccines or treatments, we we encourage you to talk to your doctor and or uh, other healthcare provider about your questions. Um, and the information that Dr. Kirchhoff is presenting is really based on what the research says and his clinical experience. And and so uh, this isn't intended to provide individual um, guidance or or recommendations. It's really general information so that you can have informed conversations uh, with your healthcare provider, and so that we can all be caught up as to where things are at with the pandemic when it comes to our community. I want to, uh, of course, acknowledge our sponsor for this evening, AbV. It's through um, an unrestricted sponsorship uh, that we're able to put on these webinars for free. So we're really grateful for the opportunity to have Dr. Kirchhoff here tonight and allow us to do this. Um, and I do have to mention, um, because there will be talk of vaccines and other treatments tonight, that webinar sponsors don't support product discussion that's not consistent with approved prescribing information in product monographs. So if uh, a doctor in our presentation speaks about an unapproved use of the product, they have to let us know that in advance. So that's just a technical detail that we have to mention because of uh, um, where we're because of our sponsorship tonight. So that's um, all of the kind of details around housekeeping. I really wanted to give you a little bit of more background about the Canadian Psoriasis Network before I um, happily turn it over to our presenter tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know us, the Canadian Psoriasis Network is a national not-for-profit organization that's led by a board of directors who uh, that is made up of people who live with uh, severe forms of psoriasis and in some cases psoriatic arthritis um, and we are a member-based organization we have um, people from across the country who are joined up with us to um, be jo join us for sessions like this and be part of um, of our community to help kind of inform the work that we do um, so we our goal is to improve the um, the lives and the quality of life of people who live with psoriatic disease, so psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in Canada. And we do this by providing information, resources. We have a snapshot of our site on the on the screen, um, and and educational events like this one, um, which I will uh, get into. Um, so I just wanted to to let you know that um, if you're interested in staying uh, attuned. Uh, um, to information uh, and events that we have, um, what's going on in Canada with regard to psoriatic disease, 
uh, and you want to stay informed and maybe become involved, check us out if you're not, if you haven't already, if you haven't joined us already at cpn-rcp.com. We also are on all major social media. So welcome you to uh, join us there as well and um, kind of follow along, participate where, uh, where you'd like to as well uh, in, in the work that we do. So before I turn it over to our speaker tonight, um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a context for this presentation this evening. So we put on these webinars. This is actually the first of 2022. Um, and it's actually the third webinar that we've done with Dr. Kirchhoff on, uh, on COVID-19. Our first one was uh, in September 2020. Um, some of you may have joined us for all of these or some of these. And, um, and that was really to kind of give us the was a, an, an unknown time still where we were learning a lot, but we still were uncertain about a lot of things when it came to the pandemic and COVID-19 when it, uh, it especially um, regarding kind of the concerns of our community. Um, and then we did another one in March 2021, and that was when the vaccines were programs were starting to kind of um, start and roll out. And so we did one that focused on vaccines and just, again, current state of knowledge, what do we know? What don't we know? What are we learning? And so we thought that now would be a great time to bring back our esteemed speaker um, to uh, let us know what's, what's happening now. There's been a lot of changes in policy recently with regard to restrictions and, and other um, you know, news on, on, on the vaccine. Um, so we thought it would be a good way to round out this series of webinars to um, get a current understanding of what's happening, uh, again, from a very general perspective, um, uh, because we do still get a lot of questions uh, about about COVID-19, about vaccines, about what's happening. And, and so we thought this would be a good opportunity to catch us all up with what we know. Um, and so we've asked Dr. Kirchhoff to, um, to join us to share perspectives on, um, on aspects of, COVID, of the pandemic that are important to our community. So again, getting us up to speed on what's happening with um, the pandemic, what's happening with vaccines, um, and and where 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 we see this going and what we learned uh, as a, you know as a country as a world and specifically as this community. Um, so with that, I really um, look forward to turning it over to Dr. Kirchhoff. We don't have a lot of time tonight, like I mentioned. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction for those of you uh, who don't know uh, our speaker tonight, um, and uh, and then I will turn it over to to you, Dr. Kirchhoff. So Dr. Mark Kirchhoff is the Division Head of Dermatology in the Faculty of Medicine um, at the University of Ottawa and the Ottawa Hospital. After receiving his Bachelor of Science in Molecular Biology from McMaster University, Dr. Kirchhoff completed his medical degree and PhD at Western University in London, Ontario. His PhD research involves studies of the signaling pathways important to immune system regulation. He then went on to complete his dermatology residency at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, British Columbia. Until August 2017, he was the education director at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, uh, where he coordinated and led undergraduate, postgraduate, and continuing medical education activities. He's published over 50 peer-reviewed papers and maintains a keen interest in clinical and ben bench to bedside research. He's been invited to speak at local, national, and international meetings. His clinical interests are varied, and he sees both pediatric and adult patients. Dr. Kirchhoff was recently awarded the Teaching Award by the Dermatology Residents at the University of Ottawa. He develops and provides the basic science lecture series for residents, in addition to weekly clinical teaching in the clinic and on call in the hospital. He's also an examiner for the Royal College Dermatology Exam and a board member of the Canadian Dermatology Association. And if there's anyone that can give us this um, kind of information in a short amount of time. I, I know it's Dr. Kirchhoff because he's really great at presenting. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Kirchhoff, and I turn it over to you. All right. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, obviously, we have a lot of information to get through, so I'll do my best. I do have a training as an auctioneer, so if I need to speak quicker, I might do that, but hopefully you can understand everything I'm going to be saying. These are my uh, disclosures, conflicts of interests, the objectives for tonight, uh, we are going to talk about the current state of COVID-19 for the psoriasis community, what we've learned over the past two years of COVID-19, talk about vaccines, the end of the pandemic. Uh, Anthony Fauci just recently declared that we're entering a endemic phase of uh, this pandemic. Uh, so what exactly does that mean and uh, what should you consider going forward? And then of course, preparing for the next pandemic. Uh, you know, we, we saw one of these 100 years ago, 
Uh, hopefully it's gonna be another 100 years before the next one comes around, but you never know. So I'll start off with a quick summary of where we are in, in COVID-19 based on the numbers. So this is from uh, John Hopkins. This uh, dashboard was used extensively initially and gives us an update on the number of uh, people who have COVID-19. Number of cases you can see is, is a half a billion approximately cases of COVID-19 that are known. Uh, it's probably more than that. Um, uh, vaccination doses are quite high, but we'll get to that in a second. And uh, about six, over six of a million deaths have been reported associated with this uh, pandemic. In Canada, and there's uh, this is the John Hopkins numbers, so total cases are 3.7 million and about uh, 40,000 deaths. This is the actual numbers from the Canadian website, so they go with 3.7 million here, you can see. Largely focused in Ontario, Quebec, uh, Alberta, uh, less so in some of the less populated uh, provinces, as you can see. Um, um, but definitely distributed across the country and there were cases everywhere. And you also can see from this, uh, this curve here that we had in these, these upticks, these increases, and this corresponds to uh, the variants, which we'll talk about in a few slides. So one of the key things we have to think about going forward is have we achieved immunity, herd immunity? Are we all safe now because there's enough people that are vaccinated or who have had this disease? And this sort of depends on a few things. So one, if there's no herd immunity, you can see transmission occurs quite easily. One infected person can give it to everyone around them. This is what was happening initially when we went on lockdown two years ago. Um, at that point in time, uh, the other important factor to, to keep in mind is that the infectious rate of, of COVID or, or COVID-19 was about 2.5. Um, that basically means how readily the virus can be transmitted from one patient to the next. As we, uh, as more people got to the virus, number one, and as more people became uh, vaccinated, the number of immune patients here in green increased. And so now transmission is a bit harder to, to take place. However, um, the virus has mutated, as we know, and has changed, and it's gone from a reproductive rate of 2.5, that means for every one person infected, 2.5 people get infected, up to 6.5 for Delta, which uh, is now passed us by, and now we're on to the Omicron uh, variant, and it's 10, so it's uh, even higher. And so what you'll see here, this trend of increasing infectivity of these different variants. However, more and more of us are becoming immune. We've either had uh, the variant in question, uh, we've either been vaccinated. Uh, and so the transmission is actually probably uh, gonna go down over time. Um, the reason why this uh, high transmission occurs is because of the spike protein. You probably heard about this protein. This is the protein that sits on the surface of the virus. It's the one that interacts with our cells. And it's the way the virus actually enters the cells. And so this spike protein uh, uh, is really of interest because it's the one that allows the virus to infect us. And depending on how it interacts with our cells, it is able to interact, infect us easierly. And so um, the more mutations that occur, this spike protein actually opens up. And you can see from this very closed conformation over here to this more cup-like formation where it's able to glom onto the cells more easily. And here's just a summary from uh, 2021, looking at the different phases of these variants. You'll notice, also notice that the, the speed at which these variants are coming are also increasing. So the variants are coming quicker, they are becoming more infective, but luckily, as we will see, they are uh, not having the same level of hospitalizations or serious disease. So here's where we are right now in terms of variants. We had uh, the original uh, the original COVID-19, uh, then the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. There was these other ones that uh, some of the times we missed them, some of them. And then now we're right here in Omicron that has been around since November 2021. And we have two subvariants of this that are currently circulating. You can see that based on this map, it is... Uh, distributed all over the world. Um, and really these things move at very fast speed and quickly engulf the world now. So the reason why I say that we're, we're actually better off than we used to be. So here is uh, from Ottawa. So this is in Ottawa, we actually attract the wastewater. And so they look at the levels of viral signal in the wastewater. Uh, and they also measure which uh, variants are involved. And so I'll show you the two graphs here. So this is the, uh, in orange here, the seven day rolling average of the uh, viral load. And you can see there was a blip right here. And this was uh, corresponding to Delta. And, and, and you can see here in the background, hospitalizations actually went quite high. Um, and that's where we went to our another, uh, earlier lockdown in early 2022. Now uh, we've seen a massive jump in this, the viral load. It's now coming down, luckily. But there's been no change really in hospitalizations. It's been relatively sta stable, indicating that this is a less uh, a deadly form and that there's obviously more immunity in the community. And really the two, the two uh, subvariants, BA2 over here and BA1, 
are the ones that have taken over and, and are really now the major variants in our community with BA2 probably coming up uh, stronger than BA1. So that's why now we, we can sort of think of this as we're changing from a pandemic to an endemic disease. So an endemic disease is something that is constantly present in the population. So we're just going to have to learn to live with this. There will, of course, be fluctuations that occur, uh, which I'll show you on the next slide. A pandemic is one where we have high levels, it has a high mortality, it's spreading very rapidly around the world. Uh, and examples, as you can see here, were Spanish flu previously and H1N1 in, 20, in 2009, this obviously being uh, not as serious as the uh, Spanish flu was in uh, um, 1918 or uh, COVID-19 now. So this change from a, a pandemic phase, so this is COVID-19, we basically have a, a large increase and then it comes down. Um, so that happens for certain diseases. Um, but uh, when we have an endemic disease, uh, influenza, of course, being the one that we're or most used to seeing, this is flu, every season we see an increase, then it goes down for a while, then it goes up, and then it goes down. And so I think what we're going to see is COVID-19 migrating into this. We will see a, a regular upticks in, in time, um, but really uh, the, the high level of mortality that we saw initially will likely not happen. However, much like influenza, likely there will be uh, once in a while, every few years, uh, mutations that occur, a variant that occurs that may have a higher mortality rate uh, that we probably need to take more seriously uh, going forward. Um, so really, the number of cases continue to be high in many parts of the world. Death rate is coming down over time. New variants are developing on a regular basis. The new variants are more contagious, but have less associated mortality. So COVID-19 is really entering a pan, uh, an endemic phase with perhaps these seasonal spikes that we uh, will see much like flu in the future. What about vaccination? That's the next arm. So we sort of have an idea of what COVID is looking like around the world. Um, if we look at vaccine uh, status, there are still pockets of the world that are under vaccinated and this does pose a problem for the world going forward. Um, so this is uh, the map of the world showing places that have had at least you know, one dose, and you, and you can see that, you know, les gens qui ont reçu au moins une dose. Et au Canada, on est vraiment... States has a, a single dose vaccination rate that's less than 80%, um, which is, of course, a problem. And all of Africa here, you can see, is under vaccinated with even a single dose, which is a, an ongoing problem. If we look at fully vaccinated status, again, um, Canada doing quite well, but you see we have a few drop-offs, you know, so if you look at Brazil right here, um, a lot of people have got one dose, but then it drops down for fully uh, vaccinated. Um, so fully vaccinated people are less than a single dose vaccinated people. And then now, as I, I will show you in a few slides, we think that we may need continuous boosters, likely every six months to year. Um, and this is the uh, additional dosing levels around the world. And, and, and really 50% has been the high mark for this. Um, Canada, again, featuring quite prominently. Um, again, Africa, there, there's basically no uptake so far at all, as you saw. Uh, India, Pakistan, highly populated areas that have no additional vaccines uh, yet. So much of the world really has not got these additional doses that are likely required to limit the spread of this disease. So here's the summary in the world. 67% uh, of people have received one dose, 60% are fully vaccinated. So it shows you that really there's a high correlation between those. Uh, additional doses, however, are still low, 24%. In Canada, we're doing very well. Single dose vaccine, 89%, fully vaccinated, 83%, and about 50% have received additional dosing. In terms of the vaccine development, we have lots of them. So when I showed this initial, uh, um, uh, summary uh, in the first presentation, there was basically you know ten vaccines in development. One had already failed. None had been approved, and then slowly it's, but surely we have seen uh, many of these vaccines now come to be approved or authorized. Um, well over twenty one have now been approved or authorized around the world. You notice that fourteen have been abandoned, so not everyone is being used. That's good to know that their science is uh, weeding out the bad ones. Uh, and that there's still many uh, in development, and some of these are actually going to be targeting the variants as we go along. This is a high list summary of the ones that you might know and have heard of. Obviously, this is a, the Pfizer BioNTech, there's the AstraZeneca, Moderna, Novovax, the Johnson and Johnson, and then you'll see some of these other ones that are distributed around the world that are approved in China or in Russia, um, have not been approved in North America and likely won't be coming here. 
The reason why we may need to have these vaccines for a long period of time is uh, the, the fact that we observe a decrease in the level of protection over time. So here's the titers. That's how many protective antibodies are around. And there's this cutoff here that below which you're, you're deemed to have less protection. And around the six month mark, the number of antibodies that are protecting you crosses that mark and goes down below that threshold. And that's why we believe here at around six months, you need that uh, booster vaccine to bring back the titers up here to be protective. And we may not need those in the summer months when, when infective rates may be low, but in the winter months, perhaps again, when we are in an enclosed environment, um, we may need to get vaccinated again. And they're, they are developing an influenza COVID vaccine combo. So you might just need uh, one injection at that point in time. The other thing that I think is important to point out is that depending on how strong your response is, this is important for psoriasis patients and for patients who are in immunotherapies, how strong your initial response is really predicts how long your protection lasts. If you have a sort of a mediocre response to begin with, not a lot of protection, you, you really don't have very long uh, protection going forward. And so particularly for psoriasis patients or patients for immunosuppressive therapy, they will uh, definitely require these booster shots going forward. So people, what they've seen is people immunized against COVID-19 would lose approximately half their defensive antibodies every 108 days or so. Vaccines that initially offered, say, 90% protection against mild cases of disease might only be 70% effective after six or seven months. But still globally, and that's the key thing, there's no indication that these, uh, that the rates of severe illness among vaccinated people are spiking in any appreciable way, which means that the mutations have not occurred that are far enough removed from the original COVID-19 to make our vaccines completely useless, which is very good. I just wanted to show you what the waning protection looks like from actual clinical data. So this is from uh, England, and there they looked at AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna. And you can see they have a lot of Pfizer and, and AstraZeneca patients on and many Moderna patients. And they looked at symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, and death over time. So since they received their, vac their two-dose vaccine. Um, and you'll note that there is a bit of decline. So in symptomatic disease, yeah, it worked out well. And then we have a bit of a drop-off here. Even with the Pfizer, you see a little bit of a drop-off. Hospitalizations, pretty steady with the Pfizer. It does drop off a little bit with the AstraZeneca. Death rate as well, it drops off a little bit. Pretty steady, a slight decline with the Pfizer there. Um, one group that uh, we need to talk about are what we call uh, the vulnerable population. And these are people who are older, who have lots of diseases, who may be on lots of medications. And in that group, there is a, a, a sort of a stronger drop off that you can see right here. So here's the vaccine effectiveness percentage. Here's AstraZeneca and Pfizer. And then you can see that it does stay steady up to about you know, 15, 19 weeks. And then at 20 weeks, it starts to drop down. So we expect it to drop down further from there. Even the Pfizer has a bit of a drop off in the vulnerable um, um, in the population, in the vulnerable population. So in, in not in a clinically extremely vulnerable group. So in a younger population, people who are healthier are on less medications, that drop off appears to be less, but it still occurs. So even if you're you know, perfectly healthy and have nothing uh, that may be impeding your immune system, there's still a bit of this drop off going forward. So to summarize, global fully vaccinated rates remain lower than targets. Ideally, we'd like to see 70, 80%. Additionally, third doses around the world are only at 24%, which is very low. Uh, waning immunity noted at six months for most vaccines, so that 24% is going to become more important going forward. Uh, and deaths and hospitalizations are uh, decreasing due to vaccinations and natural immunity. So we are seeing some protection, and that's good. Um, but likely, we're going to need an, an, uh, ongoing boosters um, going forward, probably every year. So now we'll focus particularly on the psoriasis population. Uh, there were a few papers that were published that I thought I would uh, share with you about uh, perceptions of risk among psoriasis patients. So this is perceived COVID-19 uh, risk score. So how much risk you think you're going to experience based on a variety of factors. And they, they surveyed a uh, significant number of paper. I think people think it's over 450 uh, patients. And you can see that if you have a higher PASI score, so if you have worse psoriasis, you perceive your risk to be higher. Makes sense. 
If you've uh, been quarantined, you perceive your risk to be higher. So again, you may have had exposure to COVID or had COVID. Uh, indeed, um, if your duration of disease, if you have comorbidities, if you have psoriatic arthritis, uh, your risk uh, perception is higher. If you're a female, your risk perception is higher. Interestingly enough, um, the patients who are in biologics and traditional drugs had similar risk factors or they perceived that similar risk factors compared um, to each other, but they all uh, scored higher than patients who were on phototherapy or topical therapy. And we'll discuss whether or not this is actually a valid fear or not. When we look at depression, anxiety, insomnia, and stress symptoms, and this may be relatable to some people in, in the audience, that uh, people who had worse psoriasis uh, and who had comorbidities did definitely feel higher stress um, and then, of course, the uh, the impact of event scale. So, the, how how much you think this the impact of this disease may have? Uh, if you had more more comorbidities and if you had worse PASI scores, you felt that there was going to be a higher impact of the disease. The two things that really came out of this, uh, though, were were that um, there was a noted prolonged prescription and decreased clinic visits. And some of your some of the patients may have experienced this. You know, you may have been had some difficulty getting a prescription. For your medications, you may have had some difficulty getting to see the dermatologist or your family doctor, and, and the uh, the if you did, you um, you had a higher perceived risk, and you change you ha you had a likely higher changed behavior um, perception. So um, that makes sense. Uh, so really, the bottom line from this is that uh, psoriasis patients. Uh, the requirement for prolonged prescriptions, canceling or deferring clinics for treatment among patients were the two most common health care seeking behavior changes uh, during the COVID pandemic, and they perceived a higher threat uh, because of that, which also makes sense. When we look at the actual risks of, uh, you know, things that can worsen psoriasis, things that can wor worsen COVID-19, there are a few things that are similar, but most... Pas mal de choses qui sont semblables, mais c'est pas la même chose en fait. Voici la liste qui peut maintenant rendre le psoriasis pire, c'est le stress. Il y a aussi un lien entre le fait qu'on soit obèse et la psoriasis. Shared between a COVID-19 risk factors and psoriasis. And so there is perhaps some correlation there. And you'll see in the data when I show you psoriasis uh, patients and, and what happened to them during the pandemic, that really there wasn't a, a large signal, uh, which, you know, is reassuring. So really the question was, you know, you know, what's happening to patients who have different inflammatory diseases? And, and we'll refer to these often as IMIDs or IMIDs, which are uh, immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. So you'll see that used in the next few slides. Um, and things that uh, may enhance COVID-19, uh, things that may have no effect, and, and things that may silence inflammation. And, and really the question is, you know, what does it take for a patient to go from mild COVID-19 to severe COVID-19 where hospitalization and worse outcomes are possible. When we talk about psoriasis often, and I'll point this out because we're gonna talk about TNF a lot in, in some of the slides. So the, the belief is that uh, these are cytokines here that are important in inflammatory pathway for psoriasis. So we know that TNF uh, and TNF therapies have existed for a long time. We know that IL-23 plays a role and likely um, causes uh, IL-17 to be produced. And that results eventually in the psoriatic lesions that we see. And we have drugs that inhibit, obviously, TNF-alpha inhibitors. We also have drugs that inhibit IL-23. And we have IL-17 inhibitors down here. Interestingly enough, some of these drugs uh, have been studied and are being studied in, in treatment of COVID-19, blocking various steps along the infective pathway. And, and that will become important when we see the outcomes of patients who've been treated with some of these treatments. The reason why psoriasis patients were of interest and we were concerned initially when we, we thought about psoriasis patients who were on different therapies is that when you look at the original trials, and so here we're seeing IL-17, 23, and TNF-alpha inhibitors, and you can see the number of patients that were included in the trials, and the, the, what they found is that these patients had a higher risk of respiratory tract infections, and the outcome is right here, about uh, 1.56 odds ratio, so about 50% higher uh, risk in some situations of having a, a respiratory tract infection. Um, uh, and so the question was, well, if that's true, are, are, are these patients at risk of COVID-19? That's why we we're very concerned, did lots of talks, tried to analyze the data. Luckily, um, now there's been lots of data looking at the registries and patients. So here's one example, 374 psoriasis patients, 25 countries. 
Um, there was 77 hospitalizations and nine deaths. So while there was perhaps some more frequent hospitalizations seen in non-biologic systemic therapy than biologic therapy use, the patients who were in biologic therapy didn't really have that signal. So that was very reassuring for us. There have also been studies on rheumatic disease, IBD patients, that image, remember those inflammatory diseases. And you can see uh, here, for instance, TNF-alpha monotherapy was associated with a decreased hospitalizations or death compared to methotrexate monotherapy. That will be something going forward that is very important to keep track of. Let's look at data from Canada. This was uh, recently uh, published um, looking at hospitalizations um, and, and poor outcomes um, from January to July 2020 in Ontario, Canada. So you can see here in all patients who had an IMID, yes, there was a higher risk of hospitalizations and a slightly higher risk of what we call complicated hospitalization. So worse outcomes, ICU admissions, et cetera. When we look down here at the psoriasis patients, they actually uh, didn't have that same signal. And that's the same thing that's carried out here. So they actually didn't have complicated uh, uh, hospitalizations or hospitalizations increased uh, compared to some of the other patient populations. So you'll notice psoriatic arthritis here. Yes, there was a bit of a signal, um, but that those error bars are quite large. And that's probably due to some of the more, we'll say, immunosuppressive therapies that rheumatologists may use to treat psoriatic arthritis compared to what dermatologists might use. So um, if we look at the treatments that are used specifically uh, for these patients, um, so this is a, a large uh, registry uh, looking at um, patients with autoimmune diseases, and you'll see here RA um, and PSA were featured, so not psoriasis patients, but just gives an idea of what the impact of some of these treatments are. And um, they, uh, this is from US claims data, there is no evidence of increased hospitalization or severe COVID-19 in patients with PSA or seric arthritis. And some of those patients obviously have psoriasis. And in fact, TNF-alpha therapy is associated with a 36% decreased risk of hospitalization compared to the generalized population. So it's almost protective. Here's another um, um, looking at uh, um, severe outcomes in patients, hospitalization or death in patients treated with TNF-alpha uh, therapy. And again, remember going back to the original slide, TNF is upstream of those other cytokines. So they had uh, over 6,000 patients, 300 patients with psoriasis. Um, and then what they found is that patients who uh, had uh, TNF alpha therapy were actually protected and did much better. If you were taking methotrexate, you had a two times greater risk of hospitalization or death compared to the TNF alpha. And, and, and JAK inhibitors, uh, which are used in uh, psoriatic arthritis uh, and atopic dermatitis, uh, had a higher risk of hospitalization and death than uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors. So really, psoriasis patients uh, did perceive or had a perceived higher risk of COVID-19 threat, were more likely to, re to require or had a prolonged prescription and had, and had their clinic visits canceled or deferred. Comorbidities of psoriasis and psoriasis treatment may put patients at increased risk, and really the only one is obesity to figure there. There um, is increased death and hospitalization noted from methotrexate from many studies, but biologics uh, don't seem to have any increased risk of COVID-19 and may actually be protective uh, for patients who have COVID-19. So what about vaccinations? So this is the sort of uh, what happens when you get vaccinated. So uh, this is an infection, but it could also be a vaccination. Um, what you do is you see an increase. And the reason why I featured this slide is because I want to point out that there's two arms of the immune system that are important for vaccine response. And we often talk about the antibody response, Ray talked that, a little bit about that. Uh, but the other one that's often forgotten is these T cell responses. And those are cells that are particularly programmed to kill any infected cells. And so we, our, our immune system has those two arms, the antibodies that are floating around in our body trying to block the virus from entering, and then the T cells that kill any infected uh, viruses. So what about vaccine hes hesitancy and access to psoriasis care? Um, so overall, you can see that most patients who had psoriasis were actually not vaccine hesitant, um, less than 10%. Um, and that was higher also in a, in a younger age group. So 17% of patients who were below 31 were vaccine hesitant, while the patients who were older uh, were less vaccine hesitant. And that may have to do with the possible uh, more severe outcomes in that patient population. Um, if, interestingly enough, if they had uh, targeted or standard therapy, they were less vaccine hesitant than patients uh, who had no uh, systemic therapy, which is quite interesting. And then what I do want to point out is that in non-white populations, there does appear to be some, uh, I will say, um, distrust of the medical system. 
that may be due to systemic issues in the past. Um, and about 20% of that patient population is uh, vaccine hesitant. Um, in addition, uh, you, if patients had, you'll see here, disrupted access to psoriasis care, they were more likely to feel that they had vaccine hesitancy. So makes sense. You're not able to see your doctor, you're not able to reassure, you're not able to have the conversations about vaccinations that you might need to have, and therefore you were more hesitant to get vaccinated. So what about the risk associated with short-term events with uh, vaccination in patients with immune-mediated diseases? Um, so this is looking at all adverse events and, and when that occurred. Um, so this is, again, all IMID patients right here. So remember that psoriasis patients fall under this. This is all immune diseases. Uh, so you can see, yep, they had slightly higher risk uh, of um, adverse events. And we might talk about a few of those things. Also, the older population had a higher risk. And, and really, women had, had a very high risk of having some adverse events. Um, it appears the Pfizer vaccine has less side effects than the Moderna vaccine, which we do know. The third dose uh, didn't seem to have any higher signal than the, the references uh, first or secondary doses. Just keep that in mind. So one of the things that we have seen, uh, just as an example, you know, does and can psoriasis flare with uh, vaccination? So um, from the United States, 190 million people in the US have received at least one COVID-19 dose. And 60 uh, have, people have reported psoriasis becoming worse. So the information to date does not suggest that psoriasis exacerbation have been disproportionate. However, it can occur with this vaccine, just like it can occur with any vaccine. Anytime you boost the immune system, you can see psoriasis worsening. And we have seen some different variations develop as well. So you can see some people develop uh, palms and soles. Some people develop pustular variants. Um, so your psoriasis can change a bit and can be presented slightly differently. Um, when you do get vaccinated. So just keep that in mind. And uh, if it does happen, uh, try to make an appointment with your dermatologist uh, or uh, family doctor as soon as possible. So what about the vaccine effectiveness from patients who have psoriasis? So here they looked at a population from Canada, so Ontario. So the vaccine effectiveness against severe outcomes after two doses was 92% among patients with psoriasis. You can see that right here, okay? So, and, and then... Um, time since second dose up to 121 days. So 82% still had uh, vaccine effectiveness uh, going out that far. Um, um, so that's very reassuring. Um, it, after a third dose uh, against infection, it was similar or higher to that of the second dose. So uh, up to 96% after the third dose. Um, so that's very good to know uh, going forward. Um, so, what about uh, patients who are on treatments, right? So we've talked about psoriasis population generally. They seem to be doing well. Uh, they are, the vaccine does work in patients who have psoriasis. What happens if you're specifically on a certain type of treatment? Uh, so here they were looking at those antibody responses uh, for patients who uh, had the Pfizer vaccine. That's the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and then these patients were on different types of diseases. It included patients who had psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, so but a variety of different uh, diseases were included. So um, the data here suggested that the biologics do not impact vaccine antibody responses. You'll note, uh, just as an example, so here we have TNF alpha monotherapy. So 98% of those patients had a full positive vaccine response. Very reassuring. The one uh, group that had really low responses were people who were on rituximab, mycophenolate or on oral steroids, they did not do as well. Overall, 60% of patients who are methotrexate had an adequate response, so that's uh, still lower than the biologics, but not as bad as those other medications I just mentioned. Um, and it was also uh, in older populations as well, where we do see lower response to begin with. And then infliximab uh, may reduce response to the first mRNA dose, but after the second dose, there was no problem that was noted. Here's another study that uh, came out looking at uh, some of the biologics specifically, um, um, analyzing that again in the uh, autoimmune or, or inflammatory disease patient population. Um, so here's the control group, methotrexate group, TNF alpha group, IL-17 group, IL-23 group. Uh, and this is the, the basically the, the production 
uh, a cytokine secreting cell. So how many cells are producing it? And basically, after two doses, you can see that TNF alpha group was very good. Even the methotrexate group was high. There was a few patients who were off the, the, the chart here. Uh, there's always a few patients that are seem to be straggling a bit with all the things. So that's maybe a statistical um, noise. But overall, uh, all of the patients did very well. And all of them, you can see, uh, passed this threshold um, of uh, vaccine effectiveness. So uh, what about two doses? This is specifically with psoriasis patients. This, this, this is for all immune inflammatory disease. This is for psoriasis patients. Uh, you can see after two doses, um, the patients did very well. So they had 102 patients with severe psoriasis on different biologics no significant differences at all, uh, and they all um, responded quite well. What about the effectiveness of boosters? Um, so this is three doses compared to two doses. You can basically take patients uh, who, uh, without immunocompromising disease or an immunocompromising condition, and you can take them from 82% uh, if they don't have an uh, immunocompromising disease to 97% vaccine effectiveness with three doses. Uh, for patients that have immunocompromising disease, you can take them from 69 uh, up to 88. So indeed, um, this does work. However, only 1% of these patients uh, studied in this study had psoriasis. But boosters do work. They do boost your immune system, even if you do have a condition that might uh, um, alter the immune system. What about um, psoriasis patients in particular? Uh, and if they're different treatments? Uh, and what levels did they have in serology against Delta specifically, because that was the, one of the most recent uh, uh, variants. Um, you can see here in this whole study population, the patients were on TNF-alpha inhibitors, IL-1723 and 1223. Uh, and then these controls, you can see total sample, um, and then the mean production of serum. Um, so you can see that basically the control population and the study population who had psoriasis, they produced the exact same number of, of antibodies. And it didn't matter really which biologic uh, you were on per se. Uh, there was some question about outpatient antivirals and Paxlovid being um, now the one that's rolled out a lot across Canada. So it's a, a treatment that is taken twice daily for five days. So if you do get COVID, you can take this medication. It will blunt the, the, um, the severity that you have by about 90%, so it does work very well. It, it, many family doctors and specialists are now able to prescribe this actually. Uh, so there is a, a, a rollout that's occurring across Canada to, to, limit, to eliminate some of those severe outcomes. There are other ones as well, um, as you can see here, remdesivir might be the original one, um, IV on day one, followed by IV on day two and three. So that's obviously not as easy as these oral medications. Um, uh, there's another oral medication here um, that's available. So there's quite a number of these antiviral treatments that have now been perfected very quickly and do seem to work quite well. So recommendations, patients should take the first uh, vaccine that they dose that they can get when they're eligible. Um, they should continue their biologic oral therapy for psoriasis or arthritis in most cases. Get a booster. Um, mRNA seems to be the most effective. Um, so uh, Pfizer or Moderna five to six months post uh, um, initial vaccination. You can consider holding methotrexate. As you saw, there was a lot of data about methotrexate and how it might blunt that immune response. So you can consider holding methotrexate for two weeks after the booster to try to uh, increase your uh, response to that vaccine. Next, I'll just sort of shift into uh, called long hauler or chronic COVID or long COVID. It has a few different names. I think this is important to discuss because as a lot of people are getting COVID, we are seeing lots of patients who have these symptoms. And just to make you aware of it, uh, and that if you are having symptoms, might be important to talk to your physician uh, because you can get treatments. Um, so what's a long hauler? It's a person who suffers from symptoms of COVID-19 for longer than two weeks and generally for seven months, several months or longer. So what, what are the acute symptoms of COVID? We know these, fatigue, uh, dyspnea, which is uh, shortness of breath, joint pain can occur, cough, obviously very common fever. Post-COVID, really fatigue is features very commonly. Shortness of breath is still around. We have some patients of joint pain. So if you have psoriatic arthritis, you might see some continued joint pain. Cough might still go on chronically. Um, there have been uh, several studies and I'll just feature some of them. Um, so this is a study looking at uh, patients and, and seeing what they reported as symptoms. So 27% reported symptoms after 60 days of getting COVID-19. 
women were more likely to become long haulers and all great and all age groups represented were uh, the and so the older population as well had a higher um, um, risk. Patient symptoms included palpitations, chronic rhinitis, dysgeusia, which means that's the problem with your sense of smell, uh, taste, uh, chills, insomnia, hyperhidrosis, anxiety, sore throat, and headache were among others. And here's sort of the list that they uh, got from their uh, population. So you can see here, chest pain, dyspnea, anxiety were the top three, uh, where you saw fatigue on the last one. So each study has a little bit of a different nuance, just remember that. What about patients who were hospitalized? They did phone interviews with 244 patients. 51% of them declared at least one symptom that they had did not exist prior to COVID-19. Fatigue in 31%, cognitive symptoms, 21%, and that shortness of breath, again, very high. In patients who had uh, ICU uh, admissions, they had a lot of anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic symptoms uh, later on. And so if they, they combined all of these, and obviously the vast majority of patients here, they said no symptoms. Uh, so that's good. However, there were um, cognitive impairment um, and psychiatric symptoms featuring quite prominently uh, in this patient population. And we'll get to what's going on there. So another study looking at uh, over 200,000 survivors of COVID-19, looking at six-month neurological and psychiatric outcomes. So from this uh, study, they were able to show that patients definitely had a higher risk of, uh, of neurological and psychiatric comorbidities later on. And the risks were greatest, but not limited to patients who had severe COVID-19. So the worst disease, usually the worst, uh, the, the sequelae afterwards. So here you can see COVID-19 versus other respiratory tract infections compared to inf influenza. Um, and, and dementia was higher, anxiety and psychiatric uh, um, diseases were higher, uh, muscle disease. So again, diseases of the neurological system were higher featuring long-term. So what they believe is happening, this is obviously still very early on in hypothesis that's, that's taking place, is that people get inflammation from uh, COVID-19. This can affect the brain which can lead uh, to inflammation in the brain. This can cause perhaps some damage to the brain, can change the vascular structure. We know that the receptors, when I talked about the COVID-19 virus and how it binds to our cells, it actually can bind to the blood vessels and that may cause inflammation of the blood vessels in the brain. And that may lead to these long-term symptoms. And uh, inflammation we've known for actually a long time to be related to a variety of psychiatric diseases, depression being the most common. And that's why we do see more depression in patients uh, who have psoriasis, particularly patients who are not being uh, treated adequately or, or well, because the inflammation that's occurring in the skin, uh, those cytokines circulate through the body, can go into the brain, uh, and that can then cause some of these other symptoms. And COVID-19 probably does the same thing. We get initial respiratory inflammation, but we do get inflammation throughout the body, and that can also affect the brain and cause these other symptoms to develop. The other thing that's going to be quite interesting is that depression and neurological uh, issues seem to be a risk factor for the development of psoriasis. So not only can COVID-19, which causes inflammation, worsen psoriasis, but that can lead to depression, which in itself may trigger or worsen psoriasis going forward. So it'll be interesting to see what happens long-term as this virus continues to circulate. So long-term consequences have been noted with COVID-19, fatigue and depression being the most common. Inflammation is a likely connection between COVID-19 and the neurological symptoms. And depression is an independent risk factor for development of psoriasis. So we might see many more psoriasis patients coming up in, in the future because of that chronic inflammation and that connection between the brain and the skin. In fact, the brain and the skin early on developed from a similar embryological tissue, uh, which makes a strong connection between those two organs. So finally, I'll end in the next uh, two seconds here with lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic and for future pandemics, things that we need to learn. So one, I think masks are useful tools. We've seen that over and over again. Uh, telehealth might become the new normal and an important part of healthcare. Vaccines are very powerful tools. We would not be at where we are right now in this pandemic or endemic uh, if we didn't have vaccines. Everyone is not treated equally, especially in the pandemic. That's a given, uh, given in our society. We see that in Africa, the vaccine uh, rollout is has basically non-existent. So we also need to consider mental health as a very important component going forward. Uh, particularly after this vaccine, I think the impacts are going to be seen for years to come. We need to practice evidence-based decision-making. We saw very early on in the pandemic that decisions were made that were not based on any evidence at all, uh, um, and that can lead to bad outcomes. People can take treatments that may be harmful. We need more global cooperation. Basically, viruses don't care about where the border is. We see that even when we shut down our borders in the last uh, uh, Delta wave, 
it didn't make a difference. The virus still got here. We might buy ourselves, you know, a couple of days here or there, but these viruses are so effective, they can move around the world. Education is very important and the best future investment. And just to reiterate, you know, this is a science paper from 2019. We have, we have gone through the same things uh, over again. We seem to see history repeat itself. There was a lot of public indifference initially. We saw there was a lot of uh, protests that occurred. Um, personal nature of measures needed, masks and distancing, sometimes lots of friction, but this is very important to controlling an outbreak. And, and then basically respiratory pathogens are highly infectious. We need to remember that. Uh, they can be spread very easily uh, and they can, they can move from one person to the next. Travel makes uh, these viruses spread uh, very easily. And for the next pandemic, we should keep that in mind. And with that, I will take uh, any questions. And I'll uh, stop my sharing here and we'll see if we can go through some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kirchhoff. And I um, will jump right into questions because we have a lot. And so um, just we'll start with um, trying to put these together. But one of the big ones that, and, and by the way, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's hard to summarize. And I didn't know where to go, but hopefully that was a good summary. And I think where we're going and where we've been. I think it's great. And we can pick up on parts that we need to kind of share with the community that we're getting a lot of questions on if we need to go in a deeper dive. So thank okay. you. One thing is um, that's coming up is how do how can people tell if they have a strong response? Because you talked about the waning response depending on you know your 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 immune system and and where you kind of start, and then that kind of dictates maybe how you'll respond to the vaccine. So how do how do you know? You do, you you don't unfortunately. It's 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 a it's a response that occurs inside the body. So really, you can measure titers. So you could have a blood draw, and then you could measure actually how high your antibodies go. But there's no way to empirically you know judge based on your symptoms or how you're feeling or anything like that. You could have no symptoms and have a really strong response, or you could have lots of symptoms and still have a poor response. So it's it's not correlating. Um, obviously, there is perhaps some thought that if you do have more symptoms, there's more inflammation going on, you may be having a stronger response to the vaccine, but that's, uh, I would say, tenuous association at best. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I guess that's why people are encouraged to take the boosters when they're available. Correct, because yeah. we, know. we know boosters work, and, uh, and we know that even if you are a high responder, it still goes down over time, so it's important to get that booster. Gotcha, okay, uh, another uh, question that, chunk we got from about masks. Um, so any recommendations on masks? One people, one person asked about they've had COVID already, should they still practice mask wearing? Is that recommended? And it, like in a group setting, um, any thoughts on that? Or what do you know what, what uh, research is suggesting? Yeah, so uh, wearing a mask is obviously more protective than not wearing a mask. So that that is sort of a given. The, I, I defer to the public health officials to determine how severe and how bad it, the impact is in our healthcare system and on how much we need to mask. Um, obviously, a lot of mask mandates have now been stopped in the country. They still are taking place on planes in Canada, but not in the United States. So you can see this sort of disjointed um, uh, approach to masking right now. Uh, what I would say is that uh, if you're concerned, by all means, you can still continue to mask. It shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't feel, you know, pressured not to wear a mask. Uh, and then uh, we in the hospital, we still wear masks around our patients and we ask our patients to wear masks just because it's a higher risk environment. Uh, but generally, if you look at what's happening in the trends, the, the severity of disease uh, and the bad outcomes are not being seen to the same extent. And that is why the healthcare officials and the public health officials have decided that it's no longer necessary to have mandatory masking everywhere. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Um, and some of the um, questions that are coming up are around like treatments and boosters. Um, can you give any kind of idea about um, about taking a booster, taking boosters, and timing if you're if you're on an injectable, for example? Like anything people should keep in mind in terms of the scheduling of your booster if you're on. Um, should you stop your treatment? Should you pause your treatment? Should you wait? Any timeline? Yeah, so for biologic, we don't recommend stopping treatment. There's some evidence to show that you actually can lose efficacy if you if you stop your biologic, uh, particularly for the TNF alpha inhibitors. Um, so we don't recommend stopping them. And there doesn't seem to be a major impact, as you saw from the data that I presented. There doesn't seem to be a major impact 
on the titers that you develop when you're on those biologics. It's not the same thing for methotrexate, which many people may be on um, still, but um, that one we do recommend stopping afterwards to increase your response. But generally speaking, the biologics don't have an impact on the vaccine effectiveness. Okay, and very quickly, and then we're gonna have to maybe wrap up, is Paxlovid considered safe for individuals taking biologics? So that's one of the questions, but then maybe if you can just talk a little bit about Paxlovid in terms of like accessing it and assessing for access, because uh, we had some questions to follow up on some of what you described already. Okay. Um, oh yes, yeah. somebody asked what titers mean. I'll just address that quickly. Titers is basically a number that tells you how high the antibodies, remember those proteins that block things that block the virus are, that's what a, sorry, it's a technical term titer. Uh, so it's a level of, of production or high, how high it is. So Paxlovid, yeah, so you can, ac you can access it. There's, so the government has, has set out uh, an algorithm uh, based on when you have COVID, how severe things are, other comorbidities that allow you to access and you can get a prescription uh, from your family doctor. Family doctor is now being rolled out uh, Paxlovid. We are also getting it at the hospital and we have access to it as well. So a lot of physicians are getting access to Paxlovid. Uh, in, in terms of interaction with biologics, I don't think there's a big signal that's a concern. Again, you saw that it's a very short course of, of treatment Paxlovid. So I, I don't think there's a problem. If you think that you're worried about drug interactions and you want to stop your oral therapy or methotrexate for a week or your cyclosporin, by all means, uh, not a big deal. Uh, you can do that. Um, but generally speaking, there's no interaction with biologics that wouldn't be concerned. Okay, amazing. Um, we have other questions. So I will ask Dr. Kirchhoff in the last minute, if we go through these questions and we have a couple of general ones, do you think that I can throw them back your way? Uh, and we can maybe send uh, general answers back by email if there are any like clear types of questions sure. that we can get to. Okay, amazing, sure. thank yeah. you. Um, so with that, I do wanna respect um, our speaker's time, our amazing interpreter's time um, and, and effort um, by, and I'm everyone's time who joined us tonight because I know it's a busy time. We're all zoomed out constantly. So for those of you who joined us, Thank you. Um, we're so glad that you were able to make it. We will send out recordings and we'll be posting that on our site. We'll do our best to try to address some general questions that um, many people had. Please check out our website, cpn-rcp.com. Sign up with us if you're interested um, for more events like these. Um, and there's a lot of good information there about uh, biologics, about pathology and inflammation. Um, so some of the information that Dr. Uh, Kirchhoff talked about you can, you can kind of look up there and learn a little bit more about the um, inflammation pathway and psoriasis if you're interested. Amazing presentation as always, Dr. Kirchhoff. I don't actually know how you do it, but I really appreciate that you do. And thanks to, again to everyone uh, for joining. Um, I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone did. So thank you. Great, thank you. Have a good and evening. With that, good night, everyone. <laughs>